the, the recording, I hope. Yeah, definitely. There will be two files, uh, one with both of our video and mm -hmm. one with just my video and the local right. recording. Uh, I will send both to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, before we do the talking points, I wonder whether you have any questions for me. Maybe you wanted to mm -hmm. know why we're doing mm -hmm. this and the audience and, and how do we navigate, you know, the next 30 plus minutes. Do mm -hmm. you, I'll let yeah, you I, I, I did ask, ask about the audience and I understand right. you can't review anything specific about your students, but maybe you right. can paint a general picture of who is in the audience and hi everyone in the audience. <laughs> well, they are sleeping at the moment because most of my audience are at least in America, in the East and the West Coast. And I have about 30, 35 students. And this is the spring term that we're teaching mm -hmm. about the concept of European society and the mistrust of the government. Mm -hmm. So we use the pandemic, the COVID-19 as a context. Mm -hmm. So all of them are second semester junior. Some of them okay. are sophomore. So they're all American. Some of them are from mainland China. I think there are two of them, and two mm -hmm. of them are Chinese American who are in San Francisco. Okay. And they are of various majors. So they're not really in one major because the combination of humanities, science, and marketing, so various of major. But they have one common thing, which they really wanted to learn more about Europe and how governments in times of pandemic gain the trust or lost the trust of the citizen. So I thought that this is really something that I wanted to pick your brain, if I may, just to have mm -hmm. your input on it. Did okay, that so, your so question? Yeah, of course. Uh, and so, uh, of course, Taiwan uh, is not a European government, not yet. <laughs> we have not yet joined the European Union. No. Uh, so, so I guess this is a, <laughs> a, a case, far from right. I know, I know. So it's a case study, uh, but it's not a European context, right? I would not make specific commentaries on Europe. Yeah. And the reason why I bring you in the picture is twofold, mm -hmm. because um, I have seen a um, interview that you have done with another news media. Mm -hmm. So some of my students, let me just give you this p context. You know, um, our, our main campus is in, the, in Boston. And so we have probably 50% of transgender students who are actually into politics. They're, they're okay. not conservative per se, but they're quite pro progressive. So many of them are basically not Trump supporters. So I thought that it's quite interesting to see, once I actually look at your video, okay. the and I thought, wow, I wanted to inspire some of my students who are in the process of transitioning, okay. but also wanted to do public good in terms of collective good, mm -hmm, which is mm -hmm. very, very non-American because many of them think of themselves rather than a collective group. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. I want you, you as a first digital minister you know, in Taiwan, which is really mm -hmm. a rising country, which has so much to, mm -hmm. to show the world how Asian perspective can work in various aspects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, it would be interesting for you to share your input. So I wanted to just bring you in the picture mm -hmm. and, and do the interview in two separate sections. One is okay. really look at your work in mm -hmm. Taiwan cabinet and how you look at trust and mistrust in a very mm -hmm. dynamic, effective way. That's your expert. Mm -hmm. And second, half, I wonder whether you feel comfortable talking about mm -hmm. your perspective about um, transitioning as transgender role mm -hmm. in the collective sense in Taiwan particularly. Mm -hmm. And so that gives students a little bit understanding of, oh, this is how one of the Asian countries think of in a mm -hmm. progressive way, how transgender and transitioning is being mm -hmm. perceived. Mm -hmm. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Sure, sure certainly. Uh, again, I can only comment on my personal experience. I can't really make generalizing uh, like this is how Asian country work. Right. Um, because in, in this particular regard, in particular, I don't think Taiwan is particularly Asian. Uh, right? <laughs> so, and and right. I, I mean, I, I hope, of course, that the, the other Asian countries will join us. But seeing that how um, Taiwan is the first to legalize uh, marriage equality, yes. seeing how gender mainstreaming has been the accepted norm, indeed institutionalized for the past 14 years or so, uh, I can't uh, really, uh, in good conscience, and say, you know, Asian countries are all like that. Right, of course. <laughs> because my understanding, and I could be wrong on this, you know, said 2019 mm -hmm. in March, in May, if I'm not mistaken, that is really the first time mm -hmm. that in Taiwan same sex marriage has been mm -hmm. recognized. Mm -hmm. uh, in the context of, I, I wouldn't say America, but I live in Amsterdam. You know, I've been Dutch for 20 years. Mm -hmm. So I would imagine that from where I stand, Taiwan is a bit latecomer, if I may. I know, so, I know. So, so being a first in Asia doesn't say much uh, right. when viewed in a global context. It, it, it's the point I want to make. 
Good, good, good. Thank mm -hmm. you, thank you. Shall we start with the introduction? Because um, normally, if I were doing the the recording, I would first mm -hmm. of all introduce my students. That here is Audrey Tan mm -hmm. Tang, sure. of course, and she is the digital, first digital minister since two thousand. Okay. I think two thousand fifteen or sixteen. Sixteen, exactly. Mm -hmm. So, Audrey, if I may, we start the conversation. Thank you for your time one more time. Audrey, would you mind telling our viewers briefly what you do? As your role of the minister in Taiwan cabinet, if I may. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, so, hello everyone. Good luck, good time. I'm Audrey Tang, Taiwan's digital minister. Uh, I'm in charge of open government, of social innovation, and also of youth engagement. My work, broadly speaking, is um, working with everyone uh, in order to solve um, structural issues, for example, overcoming the pandemic, but with no lockdown, overcoming the infodemic uh, with no takedown. That is to mm -hmm. say, instead of mm -hmm. anything that's top down, shut down, lockdown, takedown, uh, we uh, make sure that people across all the different sectors can invent new ideas. For example, building uh, wearing mask as something that protects one's own face against one's own unwashed heart, uh, and then amplifying this uh, with creative memes, with humor over rumor, um, and making sure that everybody can, uh, with their participation, call a toll free number like 1922 um, and say whatever comes to their mind, get the explanation in the here and now, and then make suggestions, concrete suggestions that gets translated into policy in a very short mm. time frame. So uh, in short, uh, I would say uh, we're working on democracy itself as a form of social technology. Wow, this is this is quite amazing because I will imagine that just to give the context to our students that you have the first female pro President, if I may, <laughs> Tsai Ing-wen, which is really quite uh, fresh air, you know, in Taiwan in the political history of development. I'm going to I'm going to ask you, if I may, in the past couple of years, what is what is your view on the biggest challenge in order to fulfill the role that you have been, you know, entrusted, mm -hmm. if I may. Sure. Uh, globally, of course, the infodemic and pandemic are the twin. Demics uh, that uh, threatens the the demos, right? The democracy. Um, in particular, many jurisdictions saw uh, pandemic as something as of a kind of uh, excuse uh, to encroach on the civil liberties, to further. Uh, do authoritarian control to surveil, to collect uh, personal data that was previously not collected uh, by mm -hmm. the state, um, and so on. Uh, and so they justify it, of course, saying that we need to make this trade-off uh, between mm -hmm. uh, civil liberties on one side uh, and pandemic management on the other side. But Taiwan is sort of a vindication of democracy in showing that actually um, having complete uh, freedom of the press, assembly, and so on, actually prevented pandemic from mm -hmm. going uh, wild in Taiwan in the first place because everyone can contribute novel ways to counter it together to, for example, reach three quarters of population in just a couple of months uh, to mm -hmm. build a mask wearing habits and get everybody access to PPEs and such. So um, this is the basic analysis of the pandemic. And the same goes for infodemic. There's many jurisdictions that uh, told the news sector, the journalists saying, you know, um, you're aware Work is polarizing, and so mm. the uh, state must uh, censor you or to force you to publish uh, retractions or things like that. Again, as a kind of justification, uh, because of the anti-social corner of uh, social media, uh, some states uh, starts to expand its reach um, in a effort of quote unquote harmonization, right, of the the uh, civil society discourse. Again, Taiwan did not instill any administrative takedown, mm. and we rely on cross check on digital competence, not digital literacy, mm. competence classes and uh, democratic um, participation and uh, like YouTubers filming the counting process of the right. uh, presidential uh, voting itself and so on to foster a situation where actually the clarification spreads faster than the rumors. Uh, again, mm. this is uh, a very um, heavy um, structural problem, but tackled in a way that's cross sectoral. Audrey, if I may uh, just share with you, for our American students, you know, censorship is a taboo, if I may, you know, because they really believe in threefold of information, whether it is supportive or oppositioning to the government viewpoint. Mm -hmm. So they realize that in, in, in your context, where you are in Taiwan, if I may, for our viewer who do not know the context well enough, 
Uh, mm -hmm. In the past year, when we had the global pandemic, I personally realized that there's a lot of misinformation and disinformation, mm -hmm. regardless on both ends. How do you balance in, in one way to protect the public good of correcting information, mm -hmm. which is threefold online, where it's not crossing the boundary of censorship and restrictions of you know, freedom of speech. How, how do you balance mm -hmm. it in your role, if that makes sense to you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's not a balance between the, the state and uh, companies that run the social media in Taiwan, because in Taiwan, the leading public forums include the social sector. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this is a, I guess, rather um, novel approach uh, in, in working on this, what we call the social sector first approach. For example, mm -hmm. um, Dr. Li Wenlang's message, uh, the original whistleblower from Wuhan that says, uh, quote, uh, there are seven new SARS cases in the Huanan mm -hmm. seafood market, end of quote, um, gets probably pasted on, on Reddit or 4chan or whatever uh, other social media forums, uh, but only in Taiwan's PTT, uh, the equivalent of Reddit, did it actually get the attention and the triage required mm. so that within 24 hours on the first day of January 2020, we start health inspections for all five passengers coming in from Wuhan, uh, thanks mm. to the social sector contributions. And part of the reason is that the PTT doesn't have any shareholders. It doesn't have mm. any any advertisers is entirely subsidized by the budget of the National Taiwan University, part of our academic network. Uh, but um, the governance is uh, open source. It's only mm. governed by the people who participate. And it's been like that for 25 years. That is to say, we have a digital public infrastructure that's run mm. by the social sector so that people understand that it doesn't really pay on PTC uh, to try to polarize people's opinion to mm. uh, do micro targeting for advertisements on because all these structures in the private sector are simply not there when you have something that's run by the social sector. Uh, and so this configuration, I think, is also important in the US now in the current US context, because mm. uh, US, as I understand right now, is having a conversation around redefining the word infrastructure. So that's mm. during the building back better. Digital is also part of infrastructure, including the broadband as human right and the public spaces uh, in the digital uh, world and so on that I just mentioned, which we had this discussion um, like five years ago in Taiwan mm -hmm. when we're doing the infrastructure bill, a special act, we did include the digital equivalent into the infrastructure definition. Andre, I wanted to zoom in into looking at just specific how Taiwan deal with um, COVID-19, mm -hmm. the pandemic sure. as a whole, because I think you, you, you are the country as pretty much an envy of the world, at mm -hmm. least in your, in your mm -hmm. region, if I may. Mm -hmm. and, and so what I want to say was in the past one year, there is a dispute on trust of government about how mm -hmm. government really, really That's right. handle COVID-19. Mm -hmm. Now, from where you are, Taiwan mm -hmm. really has been doing quite well from day one, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've what been post-pandemic since May 2020. Yeah. And much more so mm -hmm. about proactive rather than reactive, you know, mm -hmm. if I may use that word. Yeah. So the trust of the government, I mean, you, you really probably know more than I do, as in how do we generate that trust in the context mm -hmm. of the pandemic? Meaning, do, do, do you want to have the element of it, like if I have to create a formula per se, mm -hmm. you know, that doing this from the government side, sure. the mm -hmm. public good would create much mm -hmm. more better trust. And what would that formula would be, if I may? Sure. To give no trust is to get no trust. So the formula is very simple, is trusting the citizens, period. Mm. Uh, and in trusting the citizens, I mean, for example, uh, making radical transparent, uh, like daily 2 p.m. press conferences, uh, mm. and agenda is set not only by the journalists who can ask to their heart's content, but to mm. a toll-free number, 1922, where everyone oh. can call. For example, last April, there was a young boy who called saying, you're rationing our mask, but all I get is pink medical mask. Mm. Now I'm a boy. All the boys in my class have navy blue medical grade mm. masks. So I don't want to go to school because I don't want to get bullied, right? Mm -hmm. The very next day on the 2 p.m. Uh, conference, all the medical officers, regardless of gender, wore pink medical mask. And the uh, Minister Chen of Health even said that Pink Panther was his childhood hero. Uh, and suddenly the pink became the most hip color and the uh, boy mm. became the most hip boy because only he has the color that heroes and a hero's hero wear, right? So mm -hmm. the point here is that by trusting the citizens to come up with um, reports on novel situations as well as novel solutions, 
conversations, there was mm. a Professor Lai who called saying, um, I've invented um, a way to sterilize, to, to kill the virus from the mask without destroying the mask using traditional rice cookers. If you don't mm. add water, um, then <laughs> it actually serves as a sterilizer. And, so, and, and that actually uh, got repeated experiments by the Ministry of Health. And then the Minister Chen uh, actually demonstrated that rice mm. cooker um, right in the uh, 2 p.m. press conference, inviting Professor Lai to explain the theory behind it. Mm. And so mm. the, the point here is that if you can show that citizens' ideas are respected and listened to at scale, and mm. even if there's any uh, mistakes and so on, you apologize swiftly, but always say, by next Thursday, we'll fix it. By tomorrow, mm. we'll fix it. And then you did actually fix it. So right. it shows both empathy and competence. But uh, first of all, it's still trusting the citizens to come up with these mm. ideas in the first place. It has a transparency element there too, suppose, right? You know, which so means transparency, the government. Exactly. participation and accountability. I said that because um, where I am, you know, being a Dutch citizen for 20 years, mm -hmm. I also understood a little bit about the Dutch, how the Dutch actually approach public policy. I think that trust is also quite something that they really noticed that it's not so much about not trusting the government, but it's the other way around, it's in trusting the citizens. It's earning it's trustworthiness, exactly. right, by trusting the citizens. Absolutely. But I don't want to paint the whole picture all roses and blue sky. I mean, there must be some resistance, you know, to mm -hmm. certain approach that your work or the government mm -hmm. approaches. Mm -hmm. Can you help us a little bit about mm -hmm. what is the resistance among the general public about mm -hmm. that trust? And, and, and mm -hmm. do we have a public enemy in the government, mm -hmm. you know, in, in per mm -hmm. se, in, in a realistic society? Mm -hmm. You mean other than the virus? Uh... <laughs> <laughs> For now, yes. For now, I think that's our biggest enemy, common enemy, if I may. I know. Yeah. Right. So, um, so to answer your question, um, in a sense, we are the resistance uh, in this region, right? Because, uh, as I said, there is this tendency uh, of democracy in decline in the authoritarian models try to justify themselves as inevitable when faced with novel threats like the pandemic. Uh, and so um, we are, in the sense, the resistance. Uh, and within Taiwan, there are also people who question or criticize uh, the work we do. For example, our digital quarantine system, which reuses the location-based uh, earthquake warning SMS system. Um, basically, if you return to Taiwan, you're asked to quarantine at your residence or at a hotel. But either way, you're paid uh, around 100 euros per day uh, for your work um, as a stipend for 14 days. Uh, and if you keep this 14 days, uh, then, of course, you're, you're free. You can go anywhere. Um, however, if you break out of the quarantine, you get fined up to uh, 100 times that. So it's quite a lot of money. Uh, and how, if you're in your own residence, how are we going to know that you've broken out from the quarantine? Well, it turns out that we can reuse the same location-based triangulation uh, so mm -hmm. that the uh, uh, telecom towers, the three uh, towers that are closest to you, can triangulate, roughly speaking, which block your end. So right. within about a 50-meter radius. And so we use the same technology that sends flight evacuation warnings and so on, so that mm -hmm. if your phone breaks out of that radius, it sends message first to you, then to your local health officers, and if they found that you're missing, then also to the police officer and so on. Now, uh, some people question this, saying, um, you know, how are we supposed to know that this mm -hmm. is not processed by a third party? How do we right, know this right. will not be turned into precision advertisement? How do we know that this information would not be sold to other people right, and so on? Right. Uh, uh, and so, uh, but it turns out that because we had not declared a state of emergency, everything we do must uh, be subject to the parliamentary oversight. So mm -hmm. the uh, idea is that the overseeing body, our legislature, run this public hearing and so on, who interpolated the ministers uh, and department bureau chiefs in charge of building this digital quarantine system. And after explaining the exactly very transparently how this works mm -hmm. and understanding the telecoms already know where you are anyway, right? But they're not sending uh, this information outside of any telecom. The approval rates to the measure uh, grows from 91% uh, to 94%. Uh, so, mm -hmm. But we still think the 6% uh, who did not agree because they keep us honest and accountable. And that sounds to me that go back to that trust. Mm -hmm. You know, with that information, the citizens, the citizens who are under quarantine, we know that mm -hmm. we are not abusing 
Right, right. Much. It's a play with equity. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that, that really go back to transparency, respect, mm-hmm. and also mm-hmm. that trust. Had I not been trusting the government, I would mm-hmm. think this is a scheme of big brothers. How would I, I know? know? You I won't know. do yeah. the information. Mm-hmm. That's so right. I think that, that won't work in some American conservative base, mm-hmm. if I may. Mm-hmm. Not, I know mm-hmm. enough to say I live in America for, couple, mm-hmm. for quite mm-hmm. a number of years. Mm-hmm. So I, I thought that that would be a lot of resistance about because so many so I've seen so mm-hmm. many European countries and American citizens mm-hmm. went out to to really just just disagree government you know mm-hmm. policy mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. asking them to stay at home they kind mm-hmm. of like say that we had enough we don't trust the government we would like to have our freedom mm-hmm. even in mm-hmm. time of the COVID nineteen so right. really go back to that trust again it's very interesting for me mm-hmm. before I move on to the second half I have one question I wanted sure. to. To, to, to pick your brain. Mm-hmm. Now, you have a wonderful female president since 2016, mm-hmm. Tsai Ing-wen, who was educated in England, London School of Economics. Yep. Do you think that your role being invited mm-hmm. to join the government has something to do with there is a vision that hold by her looking at mm-hmm. how should I look at Taiwan moving forward since I mm-hmm. became president in 2016? Mm-hmm. What would you say about that, you know, her role mm-hmm and your role or bringing you into the minister? Yeah, uh, I, I will first say that in Taiwan, uh, our parliament is over 40% women. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so it, it's not uh, it's not bad, uh, certainly not by Asian standard, but also by world standards, second only to some Scandinavian right. Uh, countries, right? So <clears throat> I think already gender mainstreaming has been the, the norm uh, in the <clears throat> Taiwanese legislature in, in many uh, part of the society and so on. Now, I, I, I'm not pretending it's all right. For example, in STEM um, graduates, uh, there's still only like slightly over one quarter women. So we still need to do some work there and we're still working on that. But by and large, I think uh, gender mainstreaming has has won uh, in Taiwan. Um, I think Dr. Tsai's contribution uh, is first, of course, symbolically uh, representing that uh, women leadership, not just previously as vice president, but now as Mm. president (laughs) would work really well, Uh, but also uh, by by making sure that people in all the different levels see it's not just about gender, but also about culture. For example, mm-hmm. um, she also has a indigenous name. Uh, I think okay. she is uh, one eighth uh, Taiwan, uh, so a indigenous indigenous culture. So. Um, during the transitioning justice work uh, for indigenous people, uh, she also speaks uh, with a transcultural view on things mm-hmm. and so on. Uh, and she also helped uh, signing the act that makes all the 20 languages into Taiwanese national languages, including um, 16 or so indigenous ones, uh, the Taiwanese Holog and Hakka, um, and also Taiwan Sign Language, <laughs> so mm-hmm. for maximal mm-hmm. inclusion and, and mm-hmm. so on. So uh, I think she wants to convey and rather successfully a intergenerational transcultural view on democracy by showing that democracy could be um, indeed a conversation between diverse cultural values, not just a position between two ideological values. Mm, I think you make a very good point, um, mm-hmm. and, and if I may say, Audrey, because you point out to me that you know more than just about gender, mm-hmm. it has to be about culture. You know, That's right. so now with that, I wanted to kickstart with the second half. Mm-hmm. Really, just ask you very personally to share sure, your own course. experience, mm-hmm. because um, my understanding, and I could be wrong on that, I think you were mm-hmm. transitioning in two thousand fifteen, if I may. Mm, no, two thousand five. 2005. Okay. Mm-hmm. And so with your own experience, if I may, and how do you see gender equality mm-hmm. and this gender transitioning process? Mm-hmm. I, I, I'm, more, I'm more interested about the acceptance in the mm-hmm. context of Taiwan society. You know, well, it's definitely I... quite high, as you can see. <laughs> Share with <Yeah>. us. <laughs> Share yeah. with us. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, in Taiwan, uh, when I was uh, having my second purity in 2005, uh, there's already quite a few high profile cases of transitioning, so much so that people already understand uh, what's it like to have uh, the second puberty. Of course, there's some curiosity and such, uh, but I never felt discriminated against. So in a sense, the society itself is quite uh, trans friendly. Um, Now, systemically, of course, um, at that time, uh, 
uh, is still before marriage equality. Um, and so um, the, for example, legal protection status uh, of uh, marriage equality was still at a kind of municipal recognized civil union <laughs> level, uh, <laughs> the level where I think Japan is at uh, nowadays. Um, so of course, still uh, much work to be done. But it turns out this is not about gender, but rather mm. about um, the idea of marriage. Because mm -hmm. in Taiwan, uh, like in many East Asian societies, marriage is uh, not uh, individual to individual only thing. It's also a, a family to family mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, indeed, before 2007, uh, the families and family wedding in Taiwan is recognized as social mm -hmm. ceremony. And marriage is considered legal after the family uh, to family wedding happens, even mm -hmm. before they register at the uh, uh, Office for Household Registration. And so, uh, um, the people who are resistant uh, to marriage equality mostly worry uh, about the traditional lineages of family to family relationships uh, will mm -hmm. get hurt, uh, harmed uh, by the marriage equality. Of course, mm -hmm. after 2008, Taiwan switched to a registration only system where marriage indeed is just a matter of one individual to another individual. Mm -hmm. It's like a um, registration, uh, but not at all ceremony, right? You, you mm -hmm. don't have to throw a ceremony. And even if you have a ceremony, that carries no legal uh, weight. But for mm -hmm. people who were married before 2007, they don't necessarily know this, right? Right. So after right. the two referenda and uh, constitutional court ruling, uh, the public service in Taiwan innovated uh, and introduced this idea of what I call jie hun bu jie in or um, marriage between uh, the uh, bylaws without mm -hmm. the in-laws. Uh, right. right. That there's no father-in-law or mother-in-law uh, relationship. In Mandarin speaking, we don't have to invent things like uh, or xu or nu xi or right. whatever, right. Right? Right. <laughs> because the, the two right. families don't don't wed when two right. right. uh, same-sex individuals wed. But when the individuals wed, they enjoy exactly the same, actually slightly better uh, rights uh, compared to their heterosexual um, couple uh, counterparts. And so that's actually a very good. It's not a compromise because both generations win in a sense right. they both get to keep the value they value the most uh, and their shared value which is uh, the marriage institution itself gets strengthened uh, rather than taken away so this is just one example <clears throat> but it shows the general attitude toward gender uh, transformation in Taiwan which is always about co-creating something new rather than making you know 45 or 49 percent of people suffer I do have a very sensitive um, uh, question because mm -hmm. when, when I live in America, that was that I've seen quite a number of cases of struggling kids. The very young, they might be five mm -hmm. or six years old, mm -hmm. who were exploring their true identity, if I may. Yeah. I don't want to use gender per se, but sure. because they were really exploring identity. Mm -hmm. and, and there are sad cases about parents not knowing what to do and how to react, mm -hmm. even though they're lovely and wanted to be supportive, but this is very unknown territory for many people, sure. if I may. So for those who are out there struggling and not sure, mm -hmm. regardless of how young and how old they mm -hmm. are, because we have also elderly people who gone through marriage and kids and still wanted to go back to transitioning. I know. Yeah. So so what from your own perspective, what, what would you like to tell them to to mm -hmm. to give them some sense of support or mm -hmm. empathy, if I may? Because mm -hmm. I said that because I've seen friends who are in the 50s struggling. I've seen little kids, five, six years old in America struggling mm -hmm. and parents and friends do not know mm -hmm. what to do about it. In your perspective, mm -hmm. it seems that you have a lot of support in mm -hmm. the social context or also I will imagine your yeah, family. Definitely, support definitely. You. So what would, mm -hmm. you, what would you tell these people who are mm -hmm. stretching their head and exploring mm -hmm. their identity whereas not knowing what to do? Mm -hmm. Well, when I had a second puberty, I also struggled uh, mm -hmm. because I don't know, puberty is always a struggling time. <laughs> <laughs> Regardless of gender, I would Regardless imagine. of gender, I mean, I mean, the families For around sure. you suffer when your Absolutely. brain is trying to rewire itself, right? Sure. So, so even cisgender puberties are also quite a struggle. Right. <laughs> so, so, and and I struggle for for a couple of years, just my brain rewiring itself, right? So, right. Uh, I think uh, we need to recognize this uh, in what it is, is. Uh, whether you you call this transgender transitioning or whether it's cisgender. Uh, just having a puberty. Uh, and this is something that uh, people 
uh, are exploring unknown territory, indeed they become uh, something that's not just what they uh, had experienced before, but a horde of new experiences mm. uh, that previously their their minds uh, did not even imagine uh, that they can Im uh, experience such things, right? So, so all this is of course very confusing. Um, and I think two things uh, always helped, uh, certainly personally helped me. Uh, first uh, is a community. So mm. I get to know through the internet many people who have transitioned before, who had similar second puberties, who had. Uh, Similar experiences. I have translating um, a um, like young adults no novel uh, about this particular issue, uh, and so um, called Luna. I think that's the the novel that I helped translate, and so all this helped tremendously because I feel not alone. So that's the first mm -hmm. thing, um, and the second thing, also equally important, is transition expl exploration. It's not about conforming to some other stereotype, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so. Just like growing up, becoming an adult is about expressing yourself, actualizing yourself in relation with the society. It's not uh, about conforming to how an adult should behave in a very strict way, right? It's about creation, not just about conformance. Uh, and so uh, instead of um, asking um, your friends or family who are transitioning to conform to a certain gender stereotype, uh, mm -hmm. remind them that this is about exploration and they can actually define uh, what what does it mean uh, for them uh, as part of the transitioning uh, to to self-define to self-express so having some creative outlet it could be about writing poems singing painting mm. whatever that also helps a lot I think Audrey you make a very good point I, I read somewhere and I could be wrong on that that mm. you 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 would like to have um, non-binary and Post-gender, you know, I don't know yeah, whether post -gender, I read it correctly. Right. Post-gender, so, exactly. So, you so could you share with me. us? <laughs> with <laughs> any pronoun. My pronoun is literally right, right. whatever. And yeah. I also have students who are gender fluid. You know, mm -hmm. they really want to do not to be identified by he, she. So, mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm fantasizing in the moving fast forward. You know, to the future. You know, if I may. Mm -hmm. Do you see a date that when, particularly your country or any country, mm -hmm. who would say when the child was born, mm -hmm. was born? They don't have to identify the gender. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Would you see that coming in? You know, would you see that that is something that you would embrace, if mm -hmm. I may? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I think one of the main uh, developments recently has been the, the invention of the X gender, right? Mm -hmm. So previously, uh, it's reserved in some jurisdiction to intersex people right. who, right. of course, have a uh, biological um, rationale uh, to, to use the X gender. Uh, however, nowadays, it's also being expanded. So as you mentioned, gender fluid people, gender queer people, non-binary people, post-gender people are now more and more offered the, the choice, right? So I mentioned the quarantine. So in Taiwan, when you uh, go into Taiwan and file the quarantine card, you can uh, cho choose your gender um, as a man, a woman or, or mm -hmm. something else, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, I think that is uh, gradually become the norm. Uh, mm -hmm. And so as you uh, were, were asking, I was thinking about um, did I file any forms that force a binary gender on me recently? And mm -hmm. I can't think of any. So <laughs> okay. it's, it okay. seems that uh, at least in everyday life, uh, we're now probably already living uh, in a more or less post-gender life. Right. Um, and, and I think this is uh, quite liberating even for people who identify with only one gender as cisgender right. because that also means that that if they want to act uh, outside of the stereotype a little bit, um, they would not be forced, pushed back in. Because yeah. the entire country, just as when Minister Chen Shizhong and his colleagues start wearing pink masks, right? So pink right, right, be right. become not really a woman thing anymore right. <laughs> because the entire country was celebrating how pink masks can protect against the coronavirus and so on. So anyone uh, can join and everyone can help the society to be a little bit more transgender, a little bit non-binary. Mm. Uh, I think that is uh, the, the vision. And I'm not saying that we should radically uh, do something overnight, but bit by bit, I think we are changing for the better. But there is still, if I may, I have two friends who are expecting babies, but there is still some cultural conformity that mm -hmm. parents naturally would mm -hmm. just go to, as what you mentioned about the pink color, they were still friends of mine, they were still thinking about using pink to pink 
the baby's room should they expect a girl, whereas blue for the boys. Yeah, you know, sure, there are sure. There's cultural conformity there mm -hmm. somewhere, isn't it? Yeah, so I, I have a friend uh, in Iceland who run this chain of kindergartens and they specifically uh, taught uh, all the young girls going mm -hmm. to the kindergarten, uh, the, the sports, the athletes, mm -hmm. the uh, repairing machinery and so on. And in the same kindergarten, they specifically uh, taught young boys uh, how to cook, how to mm -hmm. care for mm -hmm. one another, how to uh, help raise babies or puppies uh, and so on. And so basically the idea is that the parents naturally, uh, out of social conformity or habit, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. teach the uh, gender, cisgender part in their home, right? Mm -hmm. So by the time they go to the kindergarten, uh, this kindergarten fulfills the other half so that right. any young child end up uh, becoming like bilingual, right? Mm -hmm. And bidextrous, right? They, they become versed uh, in all the classically stereotypically male sure. and classical sure. stereotypically female uh, work. And they grow up to be much more holistic people because mm -hmm. they can relate uh, to each other no matter what, what their gender are. And I don't think most of their children grow up being transgender, but they grow right. up to be better people. Yeah. I hear you. I mean, I like the word that you know, you're using, which we use it a lot also over this point, you know, the holistic mm -hmm. part of it. And I, I wanted to slowly, gradually go to the end of the conversation because I know I'm holding you captive as well. <laughs> but um, I know that you were a, um, a successful programmer, right, software mm -hmm. programmer, mm -hmm. you know, to begin with. And you were very young, I think, back then when you, when you mm -hmm. really noticed that you have this talent of it. Yeah, and now doing it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Now that you're a digital minister, and I know I could be wrong on that, you know, I read somewhere that you also, you have lived in Germany, if I may. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for a year, yeah, when I was 11. Yeah. 11, exactly. So mm -hmm. so you would have met exposures to German mm -hmm. culture. I, mean, I live in Germany, I study in Germany as well. I mm -hmm. mean, you, I think you also speak French, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. uh, not really, I mean, because I was in Zach I don't believe everything I read, okay? I, I, just I, I was in Zachlan, so for a year I, I did learn some Französisch. Like uh, but, but nowadays I don't practice it much anymore, so I wouldn't say that I speak French. Je ne parle pas français. <laughs> Je le comprends pas. So I would, I, would, I would imagine, because I also study in Germany, so, so mm -hmm. there is this lightness of that German culture. But my point of departure is that now you are doing what you're doing. What do you see five years from now, you know, mm -hmm. that your trajectory, that you must have mm -hmm. great plan for yourself, meaning that mm -hmm. I, would, I would imagine that in a couple of years you want to move on to something more mm -hmm. that's your cause, if I may. Mm -hmm. Could you share with us your, your plan for the next five mm -hmm. years or mm -hmm. ten? Well, in 10 years, we'll meet the global goals. So in five years, we'll meet some of the global goals. Uh, and um, the trajectory in general in Taiwan, uh, we just had an earthquake last night. So this is fresh off my mind. Uh, so uh, between the Eurasian plate on one side uh, and the Philippine Sea plate on the other, um, Taiwan, the top of Taiwan, the Savia, or Pendogonon or the Yushan uh, grows two and a half centimeters every year, right? Mm. So in, in five years, uh, it will grow, we will collectively grow around 12 or so centimeters. Uh, and so that's the trajectory, it's mm -hmm. toward the sky. Uh, and I, I use this as a geological metaphor. Uh, what mm -hmm. we will do as a society caught between the various different ideological camps, mm -hmm. uh, we will prove uh, just like this um, marriage innovation that marriage is the individual but not their families. Uh, mm -hmm. We will continue to co-create um, social technologies and improve the bit rate of democracy. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Currently in many parts of the world people hear about democracy and they think of just you know uploading three bits per person right. every four years just voting uh, which mm -hmm. is a good start but nowadays we have much better technology and everyone should uh, expect democracy to also leverage the latest in digital technology in collecting um, the ideas, in brainstorming, in coming up with new innovation without waiting for four mm. years. And I think mm. this is also uh, where many democratic jurisdictions are, are working toward. Uh, and so yeah, my job description basically uh, shows uh, how I want to move and where I'm moving. So maybe mm. I'll just conclude by reading my job description that I uh, <laughs> wrote in 2016. It goes like this. 
-hmm. When we see the Internet of Things, let's make it an Internet of Beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear that the singularity is near, let us always remember the plurality is here. That's wonderful, you know, to end the conversation. Audrey, thank you. So before we end the conversation, mm -hmm. and we will edit that when you share with me the recording, sure. I want to ask you one personal question sure. about the threat of China. Uh, uh -huh. Because, I mean, this is something that I... My students would blame me for not asking, you know. Sure. I mean, they read so much about this mm -hmm. eternal struggle between mainland mm -hmm. China and Taiwan as an independent state. And, mm -hmm. and I have a lot of friends who live in Taiwan who well, think not really this eternal, is the, just a few I mean, decades, but yes. Exactly. <laughs> this is, for them, it's like ultimate, for them meaning mainland Chinese, I would imagine, you mm -hmm. know, particularly for the party, you know, they would really look at this is something that we have to solve in our lifetime. Mm -hmm. Do you think, in general, in Taiwan, people are mm -hmm. worried, concerned, conscious about mm -hmm. what the future might lie for mm -hmm. them, I mean, or for the next generation? Well, what are you? It, yeah, it's it's of course people understand the geopolitical situation. There's really no ambiguity about mm -hmm. it. On the other hand, uh, we also understand that democracy itself. Uh, is our not just defense, but also our, our main value, right? By being uh, a demonstration-oriented, uh, action-oriented, civil society-oriented policy, it means that uh, all the other jurisdictions can look to Taiwan and see that because of our democratic polity, we are able to innovate more, innovate faster in tackling any upcoming emergent issues concerning humanity. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is the uh, capture in the slogan, Taiwan can help. Uh, right. And if everyone in the world understand Taiwan can help and Taiwan is helping, uh, then of course people would not stand by and, and see Taiwan uh, being, you know, turned into an authoritarian or even totalitarian policy uh, due to external forces. Uh, and so I think recently um, the Indo-Pacific democratic politics, um, as well as the U.S., of course, mm -hmm. have made it made this point quite clear, actually much more clear than any right. point in the past five decades. Uh, and so uh, I think we're cautiously optimistic. Good, yes, because you just had a visit from the Americans, you know, coming to the government, you know, just last week. Mm -hmm. You know, thank you, Audrey. I mean, this has mm -hmm. been such an inspirational conversation for me and for mm -hmm. my student. I mean, I really, from the bottom of my heart, it brought me great pressure to talk to you. Thank mm -hmm. you, Audrey. Thank you. Thank you. Time. Live long and yeah. prosper. Thank, thank you, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>